and realized then that I had to join the fight for our planet and for our life. So the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis. Being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom because of the floods, I grew up with no electricity sometimes because of the typhoons outside, and that the three strongest storm landfalls in recorded history all happen in the Philippines. And I feel like it's not that far off from what happens in Mexico with the hurricanes and the floods also. I will say with confidence that the climate crisis will be resolved because the people are amazing. The climate movement is amazing and we are growing. to the Creecast episode 13 now with video so for anyone listening in our Spotify you can go to our brand new YouTube channel and see us live speaking to you right now so this episode oh, yeah. we have a really special guest at once again do you want to introduce yourself <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Mitzi Jonel Tan, a climate justice activist based in Metro Manila, Philippines, and I am so happy to be here. Everything looks like there are a lot of good questions coming up, so I'm excited for everyone. Um, thank you for having me here, Cricket. It's a pleasure, honestly. Yeah, Thanks it's, it's, it's a here. pleasure. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, let's get started uh, right off the bat with a pretty heavy question. Uh, the climate crisis, uh, obviously, you're in the Philippines, and sometimes we don't really look at um, the situation around the world, so we might not understand how it is in other countries. Uh, so what's the climate crisis, crisis like in the Philippines right now? So the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis. Um, the latest report puts us at fourth most vulnerable cumulatively in the past decade, and that sounds so vague and just numbers, but really what that means is that I grew up being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom because of the floods. I grew up with no electricity sometimes because of the typhoons outside and that the three strongest storm landfalls in recorded history all happen in the Philippines. And I feel like it's not that far off from what happens in Mexico with the hurricanes and the floods also. And that's what the climate crisis is like for a lot of our countries in the global south, like the Philippines, like Mexico. It's this fear of the next typhoon that could consume you, or for you guys, hurricanes that could consume your homes and consume um, your friends and family's lives. And that's that's what the climate crisis looks like. Yeah, yeah. it's really different from any part of the world. Like uh, most parts are affected differently. And apparently the Philippines is one of the ones that are being hit hardest. So we wanted to ask about just overall activism in the Philippines, uh, since it's so different and just culturally so rich. Uh, does it change? Is it different from other types of activism? How, how is activism there? On one hand, you have a very revolutionary spirit in Filipinos. So we have had so many revolutions because we've been colonized so much so um you know that spirit is really inside us like like going against colonizers and um fighting for our rights but also at the same time i think because the spirit of revolution is so alive and recent in us the government still keeps trying to silence us and that's just activism as a whole and climate activists experience that silencing also especially in the philippines that where we are the second most dangerous country in the world for environmental defenders and activists so there's a heavy silencing happening especially on our indigenous peoples our farmers our fishing communities because these are the people who are really at the front line of environmental defense and these are the people who are most vilified and terrorized for their activism so, I mean, obviously, I've, I've 
I've kind of seen a bit of, a, of the research on you uh, that you kind of advocate a bit for not just climate change, but a change in the system. Uh, so what do you see as the main flaws in the system, whether it be in the Philippines or around the world? I think the main flaw of the system, not just in the Philippines, but around the world, because it is a global system, is its existence, really. Like, it was built to be unjust. It, it is mm -hmm. the capitalist system that we're seeing today is an overproductive over it's a wasteful greedy system that focuses on overproduction and profit and thinks that we have unlimited resources and so keeps trying to grab everything on the planet just so that these elite few can have more money and who suffers for it the workers the indigenous peoples the farmers the fishing communities the people in the global south these are the people who have to bear the brunt of the system that we're experiencing. So really, the main flaw of the system is how it prioritizes profit over people. And that's how the systems have always been. It's always been prioritizing the wants, the, the want of the need of the elite few and not the needs of the majority. And that's what we need to change. Like we have to make sure that the I think this is only a term in the Philippines, but like reverse the triangle, is that a term in other countries? Like and not commonly the, the, used. Yeah, but I think yeah. our, our listeners get it. Or like our if you're viewers in the triangle yeah. where it's it's the top one percent is on top, you flip it over so the yeah. Yeah. ninety nine percent yeah. are yeah. on top of that. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a good one. I, I like it. I think yeah. what I think we both can agree on this one. Uh, yeah, that definitely. the system simply isn't made for all of us to succeed it's made for someone to be up top like you, mm -hmm. we want to give this image of oh no we can all make it with hard work we can just yeah. not be poor but as discussed on our previous episode with will uh, it just not it's not a thing if you yeah. it, you can work your ass off 24 hours a day but and you will still be uh, well poor it's just because the yeah, system exactly. is not made to support you. It's not, yeah, not exactly. a thing. It's like, um, I mean, it's kind of the way the, the place you're born and the position you're born in, it's kind of impossible to move classes in a certain level. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're born poor, they always kind of advocate for the American dream and that you can work towards other classes, but that's not the reality. It's more like if you're born poor, you, you, you got to just work more than anyone in order to kind of survive yeah, so, it's, yeah. Just, yeah exactly. it's just another selling point for people yeah. to yeah come like to your so country. many people move, move from the philippines to the u.s for that better life and you end up having a worse life there you mm. have more money because of the horrible um the, yeah. the the rate is is so big like it's 50 philippine pesos to one u.s dollar so you're, you're rich here in the Philippines, yeah. but you have such a horrible life working in the U.S. And it's just this American yeah. dream, as you said. It's non-existent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's terrible place to be. Uh, <laughs> like everyone, this is not, not a nice place or planet to be standing on. But hey, this is what we do. We make you depressed about the world. <laughs> <laughs> remember when we were going to do more positive podcast yeah yeah <laughs> that's it's really difficult when you're when you're trying to do ad, activist podcasts yeah. so, i'll bring some positivity in don't worry towards oh, the end you guys have thank to you stay very on much. <laughs> we're really, really <laughs> pessimistic right now so uh before we go into the questions uh we're going to slip in into our little ad break so just stand still oh and um, for anyone that doesn't know if you're new if you're it's your first time listening um our actual the money that we make from the ad breaks are, doesn't go to us well technically it does but uh the money that we get we donate it uh, to the random charity yeah. of the week so it's a good cause right now we are on um, we're on our road to four dollars so I mean, we just got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, road to $4. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is our ad break. 
and keep on listening. Bye. Uh, so welcome back from that little ad break for everyone listening on Spotify, YouTube. They don't really consider our ads yet, so we'll, we'll wait for that. Uh, so we're going to get started on, as, as we do usually, the questions for our guests. Um, uh, right off the bat, what got you started in activism? So I guess in a way, I've always been very passionate about the environment um, because in the Philippines, it's so, I guess it's easy to like the environment because it is a very beautiful country and they do all that reduce, reuse, recycle messaging shit and like, okay, cool. <laughs> so it's something that is normal to you. But then I wouldn't call that activism per se because it was very individual like lifestyle change and it, it was very like individual centered like it was about me and my experiences and my thoughts so i really think i became an activist when i stopped these when i stopped centering myself and i started centering other people and that started when i was able to talk to an indigenous leader of our land so they're called the lumad indigenous group um they actually made these earrings mm -hmm. and they make these earrings because and they sell it because they have to leave their ancestral lands because they're being displaced because they're being harassed and militarized and killed um, by the military, by the paramilitary. And so they go to universities to seek political refuge. And that's where I met one of the indigenous leaders. And he was telling us about all the atrocities that they were experiencing. And then ever so simply, he shrugged and he kind of laughed and he was like, Haha, that's why we have no choice but to fight back, but in Filipino. And really, the simplicity of how he said it, how he wasn't even trying to convince me. He was just like, fight back, and then <laughs> talked about some other thing. I, I literally, it's embarrassing, but I literally started crying because I realized I had this privilege, this quote unquote privilege to choose to become an activist. Yeah. And there are people who have, in a way, no choice because they know that the consequences are worse. And it's true, though, like, even if we're not indigenous people, even if we're not environmental defenders, the consequences of not becoming an activist, of not fighting for our planet are worse, which is literally, you know, the yeah. end of the yeah. world, kind of. So, um, yeah, and that's when I realized that we have to join the fight and we have to collectively strive for system change. Yeah. yeah. And on that point, I would even argue that, well, uh, most people, if not every single human on this planet, doesn't really have a choice. It's just that they aren't affected immediately, so they don't yeah. care. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we all have to go full in, or we're, no one's yeah. coming out. So yeah. it's a tough place to be. What else yeah, can I, mean, I say? That, it's kind of like just perspectives. I mean, as you said, like when you talk to this indigenous uh, person, I mean, it, it gives you a whole different perspective on the life that they live and they don't really, I mean, I think in a certain sense, activism is kind of glamorized and for them, it's mm -hmm. not a choice. It's just like, this is, this is what we have to do or things get worse, which they are already are bad. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so, very true. It's, it's just their life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really sucks for everyone involved it sucks for everyone it's just they aren't aware yet so this is what we try so to start do making podcast. a change yeah. and you can <laughs> yeah so we want to to move on to our next question is can you tell us about the story of youth advocates for climate change in the philippines like how did it came uh, to existence um so a few of us were already part of environmental organizations different ones and then we noticed that there was no climate group for the youth and we thought for some time like okay let's you know we were kind of lazy and we we're like let's just keep collaborating like this like not really an organization but doing things together with different organizations yeah. and then we were like okay it's too it's too tiring to do it this way let's just make something so me and a few friends, we made Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which actually spells out Yakap, which means hug in Filipino because we're cheesy oh. ass fuck. <laughs> and so um, our 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 um, <laughs> our slogan is actually embrace the call to save the earth. So guys, you should appreciate the pun there. 
<laughs> so yeah, that's how it came. That's how it came about. We we realized that we needed an organization that really focused on um, climate because it's so pressing. And so we made an alliance. It's actually an alliance of organizations and individuals. So we have member organizations and we have individuals in Yakup also. Yeah, I mean that's it. It's pretty interesting i mean just like a group of friends just yeah let's let's do this i mean <laughs> yeah that's how so, most projects start yeah. out just a group of people that want to do good so yeah yeah it's just really like I, I think just like this podcast right yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, I would say that exactly like this <laughs> but with a better pun well arguably <laughs> <laughs> um so it seems like, um, as, as I mentioned before, your philosophy on changing the system instead of climate change, I feel like it's something that we don't really hear very often from people. It's very focused towards just climate change and how we have to change that. So how would you describe your philosophy and how we have to kind of tackle the issues in the world right now? So a lot of my activism is around justice. So that's why it's climate justice activist. Um, it's recognizing the intersectionality of these issues. So that means that all these issues intersect with one. That's such a horrible way to explain intersectionality. They intersect with each other. Um, <laughs> these issues play into each other and, and go on top of each other and pile up together. So those who are already experiencing socioeconomic crises like sexism and racism and class inequality, these are also the same people that are most impacted by the climate crisis. And that's why our climate activism has to revolve around people and climate justice and not just about the environment and and carbon dioxide emissions in the air because in the end the people most impacted by these other issues are the ones most impacted by the climate crisis and so if we want to make sure that no one gets um suffers under the climate crisis or like you know continues to suffer under the climate crisis then we have to make sure that these are the people that we center and that we bring to the front lines because they are the ones at the front lines. And so we have to treat them that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really well said. And it's something that oddly you don't hear very often. I mean, you, you kind of encompassed everything, uh, all the inequality in a certain way into climate justice because climate change sometimes is seen as like a separate problem. But in reality, it's just like, the thing that kind of grabs a hold of everything and everything else is also like amplified by it. So yeah, yeah exactly. very, very interesting. And people tend to just hear climate change and just figure this, oh, it's a, an, um, just a purely environmental thing. It's just a hurricane that we can stop, so why even bother? <laughs> but people don't yeah. realize yeah. that there's real people being affected right now. It's a, ah, no, it's a problem of the future. Yeah. It's just another yeah. natural disaster. We always come back from those. And, it, and it's not. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a social problem. It's not just like, oh, yeah, uh, another flooding, uh, whatever. Yeah. Like, We're very you know, desensit, de desensibilized, desensitized, well, yeah, yeah, desensitized, yeah. desensitized <laughs> yeah. to to that kind of reality because it's just like oh today in the news there was twenty thousand people died in a bombing oh okay yeah. Ooh, and you just kind of skip over it yeah. so it's yeah. crazy how like the constant uh, news and just information that we've had has kind of led to us just blocking it out and I mean ignorance is bliss so we've become very accustomed to it yeah that's so true i mean people here also are desensitized and like you know it's so hard to think that you can go against rain like what rain isn't a problem the people yeah. killing us is a problem but, but the yeah. thing is it's all the same people behind that so yeah yeah once again uh, as many of the problems here on earth are it's just it's not that there's a lack of people trying because if we can take something out of making this podcast uh, is that there's a lot of people that really do care and that's amazing yeah. to know but the focus is so scattered into so many different problems and sometimes on on the wrong thing that it simply doesn't have an effect so instead of focusing mm. on attacking the source of the problem you are focusing on just swinging at the nearest one 
So it's yeah. just a hydra. You cut off the head and two more pop out. It's just yeah, just yeah. whack them all. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we we need to have a better focus on this. So <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, our next question is: uh, We know that you're a leader, and are work tirelessly in activism in general. So we wanted to know: Does that take a toll? Is it difficult? What are, and what are some of the challenges that you face because of it? Um, so there are different levels to answer this question. Um, so first, there's the challenge that in the Philippines, I already touched upon this earlier, activism is seen as terrorism. Mm -hmm. So there is that fear, um, of course, when people in your social media are calling you a terrorist and tagging the police. You know, like I see the police and literally my heart starts pumping because I've had some experience, like bad experiences with the police. Uh, I've been illegally detained and it was just not a good situation overall. And that was, of course, for activism. I have to <laughs> um, <laughs> clarify that. <laughs> um, so yeah, like these are, that is one challenge, like that fear that aside from the climate crisis, climate anxiety, climate trauma, there's the yeah. fear of the state forces and, and authority. And then there's also, of course, how activism, like anything, like any passion is something that you can be tired. Um, and that's why we have to remember that we have to rest because I feel like it is in a way internalized capitalism. And I promise I am also a victim of this in the sense that I do not take breaks. I do take breaks, but like when I'm when I have a day that feels unproductive, I don't feel good and that's that's yeah. not a good thing because like yeah. why are we putting our worth on our quote-unquote productivity when yeah it shouldn't be about that like resting that's why i'm really trying to do that like resting is part of resistance because you're not you want to be here in the long run they want you to get tired so make sure that you don't do that like you take time to rest because you don't have to do everything in the world because there's so many of us fighting for the same thing like across the world there is someone fighting for climate justice and fighting for a better future and a better world and so when you remember that you you know you're like okay i can take a break because someone across the world is doing my shift you know if you can think <laughs> of it like that like yeah there's so many of us fighting for this thing so you don't have to do everything alone so you don't have to be perfect yeah. and that's fine you'll never be perfect no one is ever going to be a perfect activist and that's the beauty of the movement i would say yeah, yeah. because as we said there's a lot of people so it's not just take a day off not become another cog in the machine like we we tend to depersonalize ourselves we're like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna work i'm gonna work like no matter if you're an activist or just another person ever we tend to just work our butt ups uh, our butts off until we simply can't work anymore and that's just not not good for your mental health we we'll, we actually touched this uh this whole topic on our mental health episode check it out it's really <laughs> good anyone i'm definitely gonna watch that oh listen because yeah yeah, yeah yeah i'll the listen first to that video one. <laughs> yeah <laughs> So this is a landmark for the crickets, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for yeah. Spotify listeners, uh, we have a YouTube channel. Check us out there. And if you're already on YouTube, nice one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, I think also it's it's, it's kind of become a very um, constant thing where anxiety and stress has kind of grown a lot. Um, especially, I think, when when we're talking about activism, uh, we had a, a podcast with Maria. If if you know her, she's a, an activist from Spain. Uh, and basically, I mean, she also mentioned a lot of how that anxiety and stress of having to not not being able to rest, as well as when you rest, it doesn't feel like like you're actually resting. You're like constantly on edge and like I should be doing this. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's really crazy how as a society we have just kind of constructed this whole mental kind of box in a way where we're always going to be stressful and we're always going to be nervous about something about not being productive about not doing what we have to be doing even when we're resting mm -hmm. yeah it's not not good for uh, 
Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> um, so also, we we were curious to know because you obviously work you as as what said tirelessly, and it's kind of impossible to not come about challenges. So what have been some challenges either dealing with your community or trying to make a change in your lifestyle or something like that? Um, in the community, one big challenge is how, even though the Philippines is so impacted by the climate crisis, and this isn't just the Philippines, it happens in a lot of countries in the global south and in Asia, um, we know about climate change, but the extent of knowledge of most of the people is just there, climate change. Like no one knows about the science behind it or that it is being caused by the fossil fuel industry and by the system of overproduction that we have. And that makes it hard because then people think it's a natural thing. Like what you guys said earlier, it's just a natural disaster, um, a, a name for a natural disaster. And the way that's because the way it's taught in school is so westernized and foreign and technical, like, oh, melting ice caps and polar bears, which are important. But I was already feeling the climate crisis as a kid, like growing up, and I was learning about it in school and I cared about it in school, but I didn't put two and two together until so much later because the way it's taught to us is not empowering at all. And that's why that's like one major challenge. Like we couldn't use the word climate justice in our name in Yakup because climate justice like what does that mean like mm. now it's like the more people know what climate justice means because of the work being done by activists but when we started out we had to like if you say climate justice like what does that justice for the weather like what does that mean <laughs> like people wouldn't understand that so a lot of it is like communication making sure that people understand that this is something that we're experiencing today but also there's something we can do about it and we have to do something about it. And in the personal life, I am um, shifting from, you know, I am becoming pescatarian right now. So that means I only eat seafood. I don't eat um, meat except seafood meat. I don't yeah. know what it's called, um, but it's difficult because I really miss burgers, guys. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> um, a really personal thing. But yeah. Um, um that's something that i chose personally because i have the privilege and the access to do it yeah. um i don't think i'll be able to give up seafood just because we're a like we're an island country and it's so yeah. part of our culture and when i hang out like we go to fishing communities a lot and they offer us food and we have to eat mm. like whatever yeah. they give us so um but it's, it's something i'm also trying to lessen whenever i can but it's not i'm not advocating for individual lifestyle changes that's just something that if you want to do it, you can do it. But remember, there are different privileges, and not everyone has the same like accessibility to these changes. So it's fine if you can't do it yet, or if you don't want to. Yeah, at all. I think that's a really good point. That it, you always hear about how all these activists are either vegan or just like flat out don't eat, and it's like it's cool, but you're not forced to. Like you're, it's not, it's their personal choice. And even if it seems like daunting or they're pushing it on you, you personally don't have to do anything as long as you are informed on the consequences of your actions. Like you, like we, we spoke of this, I think on episode 10 or 11 uh, about the consequences of eating meat. And like here, uh, Masa and myself eat meat. Like we, we just flat out do it's not we no no kind of special diet but we understand why and how things happen we were already talking yeah. about like solutions and just things to to put instead of just meat so it's it's really nice hearing someone being like ah, you, you don't have to it's a personal choice because it is yeah, yeah i mean you can, but like, it at the end of the day, it's the systems that need yeah. to be changed, and yeah. demand can do something to that. But then you have to go beyond it, like because yeah. if you look at it, individual lifestyle change, it's a narrative being pushed by the fossil fuel industry. Like they they made up the term carbon footprint, so we compute our own carbon footprint, not knowing that their carbon footprint is causing the destruction of the world, and so that's just something. And I. 
sorry, this is a rant, cool. but I absolutely hate it when European vegans or like white vegans like go to indigenous peoples and like, oh, why are you eating meat? Like, oh, fuck <laughs> off. Like, these people are so much more sustainable than you ever will be as a vegan. Like, indigenous peoples, like, this is part of our culture. And so, for <laughs> to have like someone from, from, a global north country tell someone in the global south like oh you should be you, you shouldn't eat meat it's kind of like my lifestyle is probably a lot less <laughs> emit, polluting compared to yours but it's not about our lifestyles it's about the system so yeah yeah it's kind of like i mean there's no reason to go around preaching to everyone that they should eat meat i mean if you're well informed and you and you can't or you decide not to change your lifestyle choice it shouldn't be shunned upon and like completely it should it shouldn't be a point of attack for people and as you said i mean how are you gonna like go into communities who are definitely more sustainable and just be like oh you should change your lifestyle because we're instagram whoa, whoa, vegans. Whoa. <laughs> whoa, dude, just do it like, no dude come on <laughs> yeah it's it's a, a good point that we I, it came out of nowhere like this one's in, in the question that was yeah. an organic <laughs> conversation so <laughs> it was really nice so right now if you had the power to change three major aspects about how our society works and its structure what would you change i'm torn because I don't think I should be the only one to decide oh, that but that's not a question. because Do the it. type of society yeah. I want, the type of society I want is the one where people decide and not just one individual. And I guess that's my answer to that mm. also. Like the society we have, it should be one where majority of the people decide and not just an elite few. Yeah, so democratic. And the, yeah, well, truly democratic. I mean, we have democracy yeah, now, no, yeah, but, but they're not really. But like democracy, yeah. democracy, not like. <laughs> demo yeah, not yeah, like, yeah, like not like China democracy. democracy. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a nice answer. Um, yeah, like it's a, it's a really nice yeah. answer. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks. Um. <laughs> I, I say smart things sometimes. <laughs> well, this whole podcast has been a really nice insight. Yeah, the, the camera and video really helps. Yeah, as well. it, it makes you engage. Makes it more, if you, yeah, more natural. Yeah. <laughs> should... yeah. So anyone on Spotify right now, you guys should check out the YouTube video. You're missing out on a lot of facial reactions. Yeah, you, you're you're missing her ears. <laughs> there you go. Like you you, you can see the ears. <laughs> exactly. You have to know about. You the can ears. see my beautiful background. <laughs> my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. so after our rant <laughs> um so i i think it's fair to say that you are one of the more known activists uh in climate justice activists especially uh so how does that like feel i mean is that ever like a, a big pressure or something yes oh my god like i this is, it's so weird to me because like this is gonna sound like a flex, but I promise it's not. Like I, I just woke up with the verification on Twitter, and it's so weird to me. I was like, "Am I on the wrong account? What, what the fuck is happening?" Like I literally, like, wait, what? <laughs> um, it's so weird to me because my activism again has never been about me. It's always been about other people, about the collective, and so sometimes I have to catch myself because I'm like, "Do I actually want to talk about this?" Or am I feeling pressured because I feel like I have to talk about this issue because people expect me to talk about this issue? And, and there is a pressure for sure because I, I'm starting to doubt, like, am I the most real self that I can be on social media? I mean, I know we all kind of like, you know, have a persona on social media, but, but there are times when I'm like, okay, I want to, you know, um, like post this really random tweet and just 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 tweet this meme and i'm like wait people following me follow me for climate stuff if i tweet this really <laughs> random meme is it gonna be like but i'm trying not to so you're gonna see like my twitter and my instagram posts are gonna be like sometimes it's just me tweeting 
Taylor Swift lyrics, especially lately. So yeah, I, I saw just that. Mean, <laughs> in the middle of the night, too. Yeah. So like, it's. I'm really, really trying my hardest to still be myself on social media because I don't want people to see just the activist side of me because that's not me. And if they just see that, they'll think that they have to be like that yeah. too. Like activists have to always be these angry, calling yeah. out climate, always smart. And I'm just like, guys, I'm really dumb sometimes. Like I have no brain cells sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> right so like that's what i want people to see that i am a normal person and so anyone can do what i'm doing because mm. literally i'm just like anyone yeah. else it's the yeah, that's uh, another thing like with people start to idolize people and when you do that you start to make ironically you start to make them less like people and more like characters mm -hmm. that are in your mind as oh look this is the perfect image of how i should be and do and it's just uh, there are people too like you should act like yeah. a person too we, you don't have to yeah. be full activist mode 24 7 and be angry about the world yeah. and yeah. everything because one it's not healthy uh, it doesn't sound yeah. healthy at all like being angry all the time and not a thing shouldn't be and just overall yeah. Like, that's not how you get things done. Once you mm. just go full in activist, ironically, you make less change than if you were just a normal person that cared for other people. So... Yeah, because yeah. I, don't, I don't think anyone can actually ever be full on... Act like, everyone you see who looks like a full on activist, they're Perfect. not. They're, they're actual people yeah. there. They're yeah it's it's impossible i mean it's like these people are people they have they have many different things i mean they're it's not just activism is their life i mean they also have either family or friends or any anything and they also have problems as well like that things can happen in their lives and sometimes when people idolize people they forget about that and it's just like hey why aren't you doing this right now <laughs> And yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine it's very difficult. Yeah. So, uh, moving on to another question. Here we have, uh, how was the process and experience with Mock COP26? That was very fun because, um, so if you guys don't know, Mock COP26 or Mock COP26 is, um, well, First, COP26 is a conference of parties, the 26th conference of parties. So that's when um, all stakeholders and governments and world leaders come together to talk about how to fix the climate crisis. Um, it was supposed to happen last year, 2020, but it got postponed because of COVID um, to this year, 2021. But the, the youth last year decided to go on with it, um, but online and show that it is possible for um, activists from the Global South or MAPA, which are, we're going to talk about in a little bit. I'll start calling it, it MAPA right now because um, that's what I'm more used to. So they, the MAPA COP26 showed that it's possible for MAPA to be at the table, to be talking in these climate pol um, climate discussions and really making sure that the people also organizing it isn't all men, but also like I think the split was... 50 50 and then there were non-binary people too so like not like cop 26 where the, the what the politicians do is usually led by an all white men team and as, how as you do, as you do. <laughs> that's everything here <laughs> and, and while these pe the this, these, are, these aren't the people that are most impacted by the climate crisis and so how will they know the urgency of the crisis if they're not most impacted by it. If, if we don't have women in non-binary and LGBTQ leading the table also, they will be left behind. If we don't have people from the Global South or MAPA, they will be left behind. So we have to make sure that our leadership is representative and um, truly, again, for the people, by the people. Yeah, people yeah. tend to be against this. Uh, just like, oh, uh, they were trying to push an agenda why why do we have to be so inclusive it's just liberal media and it's just i mean i, I get 
why because I, I like to delve into that kind of mindset from time to time and I get that it might be scary to see different people Ooh. but uh, that they're people and if you try to make the most accurate and healthy kind of organization you need to get as many perspectives as possible and you can't get that with the same group of people that becomes just an eco chamber and it's just not yeah. not good for anyone involved yeah so yeah you always have to have different people who have different perspectives as we mentioned before because otherwise it's just going to be it's it's unrealistic and it's not an actual like demonstration of how the situation is so yeah um and that actually leads on to as you as you mentioned mappa uh it's something that really caught my eye and my attention Uh, it sounds like a really cool project, and I was just wondering if you've had like any cool experiences with people or communities, um, or yeah, any stories. So MAPA, or Most Affected Peoples and Areas, is this term that we started using um, instead of the Global South in Fridays for Future, because we wanted a term that was our own. Um, it started from someone, it, it came from someone from XR, actually, Extinction Rebellion from India. Um, and I should have said something earlier because MAPA in the Philippines means map, but, but I was like, eh, it's fine. It, it um, also means it in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know, same colonizers, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like, basically what we did is we made a place where people from the global south in Fridays for Future, in the youth climate movement can come together and empower each other, especially because we have to be real, like Fridays for Future and youth climate movements in general tend to be like very European and white, especially in the beginning. And now you're really seeing how things are becoming more intersectional and you're having MAPA at the table and given space and amplified and having that safe space where we can just help each other and, and talk to each other and not be afraid of you know, anything, because we know we all understand each other to an extent is so important. Um, so that's what MAPA is. And and I have made like some of my best friends um, from India, Desha Ravi and, and um, Adriana, you, you guys might not know Adriana, but she's from Mexico also. Um, two of my closest friends are from um, Mexico. I have like, like, we've just made real friendships through through this group, because we all know that we're being silenced by the same type of people so yeah. there's that like common pain i guess that's bonding us <laughs> yeah i mean sad to see that it needs to be through these methods but it, it goes to show that even in pain there's a little light yeah. so there, there, there's always yeah. something good to get out of this situation at, at the end of the day like here on a on our podcast we tend to have that the same conversation of how everything sucks but there's something that <laughs> rises out from that suckiness and starts to be a, just a light in the tunnel it's like oh well yeah. everything it's pretty pretty dark I and mean, it sucks all around but look at this thing it isn't it nice yeah. <laughs> like yeah it's it, i mean and also that's why like I mean, we, we have to constantly be looking for people to bring on because it's, I mean, who just wants to hear two white males with privileged opinion on the world? Like we need to actually just give the platform to people who, who live different lives and they, they see different realities and they can, they can share it with the world. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, yeah, there's light we everywhere. Have, I love <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. There's There really is light. I'm impressed. Like two white boys on Discord yeah, yeah. <laughs> seeing this. That is, you know, something else. <laughs> yeah, it turned out so small too. Like it's just yeah. as this little project, and it grew to so much more. It started as it started as a joke. It started as a joke. <laughs> I have I have so many things that have started as a joke, and like <laughs> yeah, but it was genuinely just like a school English project or like uh, yeah. like Quickcast, isn't it funny? <laughs> And then it actually grew into something. <laughs> so yeah, proud of that. 
<laughs> no, Yakup started as a joke. Like Yakup was like, "Oh, haha, let's make a climate thing." You're like, "What? No!" And then, like a few months later, like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> We're going serious. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's how all the good things yeah. start. But yeah, that that those are uh, things for the Q and A later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So. Uh, moving on, we wanted to ask uh, one of the hardest hitting questions and things that our people, our, our listeners and, and viewers would want to know, especially from you, since you're such a big picture uh, in the just the, the whole fight for future and activism in general, is do you think that the climate crisis is looking better, worse, or do you think it could be resolved at all? So yeah, definitely. Um, I will say with confidence that the, the climate crisis will be resolved because the people are amazing. The climate movement is amazing and we are growing and we are uniting and we are doing everything we can. and. We are literally a global movement. Like if you ever feel, I, I'm not gonna lie. There are times when I feel so hopeless. But when <laughs> you feel that, remember that there is someone in every plan, uh, every planet. There's only one planet. Every continent fighting for the same thing that you are, and we are getting stronger, and we are getting more united. And we don't need one perfect activist. We need a billion imperfect activists, and you can be one of them. And anyone can be one of us. And that is what gives me so much hope remembering that i am with people i am doing this with so many others and the youth is a revolutionary generation like in almost every historical movement we've seen the youth leading the way side by side with marginalized sectors of community and winning oppressors have always lost so now it's our generation's turn to change the world it's our generation's turn to win this revolution And if anyone can do the impossible, it's us. So yeah, definitely. I feel like climate justice will be achieved. Yeah. I mean, wow. I, I feel empowered and hopeful. I feel ready. <laughs> like, let's go beat the system in the butt. Yeah, I, I'm actually like really relieved to, to hear you say that because like it, it's not uncommon for people to feel like, yeah, this is done. Like it's not yeah. a rare conversation where we're like, like our, our friends, like in general, like not even the two of us just sitting around and we're like, why are we studying? Oh, so we can have a better <laughs> job in the future. Well, there's no future. <laughs> Everything's done in like 20 years. Like, yeah, it, it isn't <laughs> bad. That's definitely. Yeah. But that's a really positive view, man. I, I think that's, I, Yeah, let's let's go. So, yeah, <laughs> and we I think uh, we should share this optimism. We tend to be really pessimistic. Well, not pessimistic. We tend to disguise it as <laughs> yeah. realistic. But yeah, we, we tend to be really <laughs> pessimistic sometimes. So and yeah. you, you're like correct. It's not like wishful thinking. It's not like yeah, yeah. we can do it. No, there's an actual motive <laughs> and reason behind it. So. Definitely. Really relieved and happy to hear that. Moving on to, to the big four right now. Yeah, the big four. So you just inspired us, but we have a critical question of what young activist inspires you? Oh, you guys aren't going to get the answer you want. It's, <laughs> it's what I've been saying since a while ago. It is the people. It's not just one activist really like it. I have made such amazing friends from across the world and they work so tirelessly and all of them really inspire me and, and really it's the indigenous peoples who started my activism. Um, they're the ones, they're like my biggest inspiration and, and it just goes to show that anyone can be an inspiration. Like sometimes you don't even know but your friend is already inspired by you. So like it, it's, it's really amazing. So yeah, yeah, just to get that right, your biggest inspiration is the people. Yeah, well, that, that's how. Well, we, we're not like looking for yeah, specific that's a really answers. Nice answer. that, that one, I think we, we were secretly looking for that one because that that, that inspired <laughs> us. Like <laughs> damn. So, <laughs> uh, in your personal life, 
do you have any big inspirations like not necessarily the people but do you have like a, a cousin or something that inspired you to be like this <laughs> it's not the people guys not kidding um <laughs> i guess in a way like <laughs> let me look for an answer hold on it's it really is the people like i guess in a way i was brought like my my grandmother's sister is a nun mm -hmm. and she was part of the movement that brought down our dictator like 20 ish years ago Now I'm probably getting that wrong. Nope, it's 2021 already. Never mind, not 20 years ago, like further back, I think 30 something years ago. Um, <laughs> she she was part of the movement that brought down um, our dictator and, and that is so inspiring to me. And I realized looking back as an activist that she was giving me like nuggets of wisdom growing up. She was like, oh, Mitzi, look at your history book. Look at how it's praising the US so much. Why do you think that? And I'm just like, I don't know, because they're cool. And then she's like, no, <laughs> they wrote the history books because they won the wars. And I'm like, oh, cool. So like, <laughs> I guess in a way that shaped my my activism and my worldview a lot. Like the people around me growing up, um, they were, I guess, in a way more progressive and more revolutionary. And so yeah. it's always been very like in my nature, I would say, the the tend to become like this because of the way I was brought up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, great answer. As, as always. The people and the grandmother and nun that took down <laughs> the dictator. That's a really good one. That's, a, that's one for the books. <laughs> um, so now with the uh, two final ones, these are probably the biggest, uh, most complicated ones, I guess, uh, which are three goals for your future work, whether it be activism or if you have any separate projects from activism, three goals. And these goals are short term or long term? Those goals can be in anything. general, like yeah, that goals. you have in your mind. <laughs> I feel like I've been saying the same thing. Okay, so like the biggest goal, of course, is to change the systems. I'm not gonna go into that again because I've already talked about that for like 45 minutes or something. <laughs> But um, concrete goals um, nationally is to have, um, I'm going to get a little bit technical with you guys. So nationally determined contributions, this is something that each country has to give because that's how you, that's that's your like promise on how many, like how much you're reducing your emissions to go into the Paris Agreement, which is one of the biggest climate agreements right now. Um, So getting a concrete nationally determined contribution for the Philippines that's actually decent and for the yeah. people. Um, another one would be to repeal the, there's a terror law in the Philippines called Anti-Terrorism Law of 2020. It, it's the one that's really um, threatening to silence the voice of activists and calling activists terrorists. So that's another. Um, and then another one would be To have policies that protect democracy and um um yeah oh no 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 i changed my answer because that's kind of like the second <laughs> one um the third one would be to have like across the world a, a fossil fuel um moratorium so no more new fossil fuel industries and the global north countries that can already do a just transition they have to do that also there is this project that I'm involved in called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it basically forms this thing where kind of like the nuclear um, non-proliferation treaty that fossil fuel industries are like massive weapons of destruction. So we have to stop investing in it, stop subsidizing it, stop making them. Um, so yeah. Really nice. Those are the so three stay things. tuned for those three. Very ambitious. Yeah. I think it's it's way, way better to dream big. To be like We'll, be, we'll bring you back once they're completed. <laughs> so see you in two weeks, I'll say. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, hard work, but we, we are really grateful that you're making this. So on to the, the big final question. This one might take a while or it will be instant. It really does vary. 
So, what mark do you want to leave in this world? I don't want to make a personal mark of it. Oh. I, everything, so cheesy, <laughs> everything I do is really at this point for the people. Um, that's why it's so weird to me that people are like, oh, Mitzi, you're so inspiring. And I'm like, I'm just one person, guys. <laughs> like, the mark that I want to leave on this world is that I, like, if, when, when I'm gone, why is this suddenly so sad? <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> what I want people to remember is that I am someone who never, who always centered other people, especially the ones most marginalized, and that everything I did was always out of love. Now, oh God, that sounds so cheesy, cool. but like, <laughs> I am someone who loves passionately and honestly, and my activism stems from love and not, it used to be from sadness and fear and anger, but it doesn't come from there anymore. And those are all valid reasons, but now my activism stems from a place that is more sustainable, something that they can't take away from us, something that I won't get burned out because of, and that is love, love for the people and the planet. And that's not to say like rainbows and unicorns and sparkles and magic and stuff, but like love is how you stick to difficult decisions. Love is how you make sure that you don't give up on people and and loving truthfully means that if your friend is doing dumb shit and being racist or whatever you're gonna call them out if your friend is being sexist you're gonna call them out and you do it out of a place of love because you know you want them to change because you know you want this movement to get better and when people criticize you and say bad like valid criticisms towards you and they they call you out on things you might get hurt i might get hurt you will get hurt of course but I still listen to them because I know that they're doing it out of love because we want this movement to be better because we're fighting for a better world. And so that's what I want people to remember that love is how you win revolutions. Wow, that's always great answers. Great answers. By the way. Yep, yep, indeed. Well, I think <laughs> that's a wrap. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's been a great yeah. talk, honestly. I, I really enjoyed it full of knowledge yep. uh <laughs> just overall <laughs> great talk yeah. i hope i i got in that hope and yeah. light and positivity definitely. towards the end yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely. We, we really needed that <laughs> so uh, for everyone listening this has been episode 13 of the creek cast thank you very much for listening or watching yet again on uh, our YouTube channel, out now. YouTube yeah. channel? Well, let's hope <laughs> the Greek not this would be awkward Like if the YouTube channel wasn't ready by this time. But let's go to this. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. Remember to follow <laughs> us at the underscore crickets. It's weird spelling, but you're already here, so you know how to spell it. Uh, so, and yeah. uh, thanks to you, for Mitzi. Coming in. Uh, it's, been, it's, it's really been Thank a pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Peace. Bye everyone. <laughs>